The last topic that we are going to cover in chapter 12 is fluid dynamics, which concerns fluids in motion. Now, fluid dynamics is a very difficult subject, and uh, there are it's an area of active research, and there are many uh, unsolved problems in fluid dynamics. Um, however, we uh, one one thing with fluid dynamics is that mathematically it's notoriously difficult. However, uh, for the purposes of this elementary course, we are going to get rid of all, we are going to make a bunch of assumptions and that will get rid of all the complicated stuff. And ultimately, it's just going to be two simple equations. So you have nothing to worry about for this course, but in general, uh, I just wanted to make the point that fluid dynamics is a very, very, very complicated subject. Okay, so let us make a few assumptions regarding fluids. And uh, once we make these assumptions, uh, we're going to call the fluid an ideal fluid. So uh, ideal fluid is a fluid which satisfies all the assumptions which I'm about to state. OK, so the first assumption that we're going to make is that uh, the flow of the fluid is steady. So what does that mean? Suppose you have a pipe, and the pipe can does not necessarily have to have a uniform cross-section. Suppose you have this pipe, and uh, there is some fluid like water flowing through the pipe. If you just keep track of the velocity of the fluid at this point, you'll find that the velocity at this point is fixed that is what steady flow is so if you just keep track of the velocity at one point any point in the fluid uh, you'll find that the velocity is fixed you might find that the velocity at this point so let's say that the velocity here is three meters per second always you might find that the velocity here has a different magnitude and direction maybe it's five meters per second um, in a different direction but here too if you keep uh, track of the velocity over there, you find that it's the same velocity um, all the time. So steady flow means that the velocity of a fluid at any fixed point does not change with time. Now there is another related concept here. If you now follow a tiny element of fluid uh, as it's moving along, Suppose this is the path taken by a tiny element of fluid as it's following the uh, flow. Uh, this path is called a streamline. I'm just mentioning these. We are not going to use these concepts uh, in what we are going to do. But I'm just mentioning these uh, because you might hear these terms in a more advanced course. Okay, so a streamline is the path taken by a massless fluid element, a tiny element of fluid. You can just think of it as like a water molecule uh, or a molecule of the fluid that's flowing along, uh, flowing along with the fluid. So the path taken by that is what we call a streamline. Okay, the next assumption is that the fluid is irrotational, which means that um, if you place a paddle wheel anywhere in the fluid, like this paddle wheel over here, uh, the paddle wheel might be uh, carried along as a whole, but it will not rotate. So what that means is that the fluid does not have any eddies or whirlpools in it. And th there's a reason we are making this assumption. It's because Uh, eddies and whirlpools are extremely difficult uh, to analyze mathematically. So that's the reason that we just assume them away. Okay. The next assumption is that the flow is non-viscous. That means that uh, the fluid does not have any viscosity, so there is no fluid friction. Uh, you know that different fluids have different amounts of viscosity. You know that honey is a very viscous fluid. Water is 
uh, in comparison to water. Uh, water has some viscosity. Alcohol has less viscosity than water. Liquid nitrogen, uh, if you've ever seen it, has very, very low viscosity. So if you ever see liquid nitrogen, and I could have showed you this in, in class, uh, if you just give it a stir, it will just keep on uh, rotating for a very, very long time, unusually long time. So um, different fluids have different amounts of viscosity. Uh, we are just going to assume that our fluid has no viscosity, so the flow is non-viscous. And finally, uh, we are going to make one more assumption, which is, the which is that the fluid is incompressible. And that is actually a good assumption uh, for liquids because most liquids are incompressible. Um, but it's not a very good assumption for gases because, uh, you, as you know, gases are quite compressible. Okay. So, a uh, fluid that obeys all of these assumptions is called an ideal fluid. And once you have an ideal fluid, you can write down two equations which we are going to discuss now. The first of these two equations is called the uh, equation of continuity. All right, so let me explain the equation of continuity. Suppose you have a pipe with a varying cross section. Let's say that the area of the pipe over here is A1 and the area of the pipe over here is A2. Okay, let's say that uh, the velocity of the fluid over here is V1 and the velocity of the fluid over here is V2. All right. Now, the equation of continuity says that A1 V1 equals A2 V2. So if the cross section of a pipe is changing, then the velocity of the pipe will also, velocity of flow through the pipe will also change. And in general, where the cross section is smaller, the velocity of the flow will be greater, right? So uh, the product of A and V is constant. So if A goes up, V will go down. And if um, A goes down, V will go up. I'm just going to quickly explain why this equation is true. It's very easy to see that. Um, consider uh, an amount of time, delta t, a small amount of time, delta t, right? So in time delta t, suppose you have a water molecule over here. In time delta t, uh, how far will that water molecule move? Let's say that it moves from here to here in time delta t, right? Uh, what is this distance going to be? The velocity here is v1 and delta t is a very tiny interval of time. So uh, the distance that the water molecule will cover is going to be v1 times delta t, right? So in time delta t, a cylinder of water, which looks like this, so since this applies to every water molecule at this phase, a cylinder of water of length v1 times delta t will have moved into this section of the pipe, right? Okay, now in the same amount of time delta t, a cylinder of water of length v2 delta t will have exited this length of the pipe from the smaller end, right? Now, a fluid is incompressible. That was one of our assumptions. So that means that the volume of fluid that entered at one end has to equal the volume of fluid that exited at the other end, because otherwise um, some fluid would have to compress in order to uh, make uh, in order to make room for it so if 10 cubic meters of water entered on the left end exactly 10 cubic meters of uh, water has to exit on the right end in order to make room for it because it's not possible for water to squeeze and uh, and make room so from there since the fluid is incompressible
volume of fluid entering on the left is equal to the volume of fluid exiting on the right. Let's calculate the volume of fluid entering on the left. So that's just the volume of the cylinder which has length V1 delta T and area A1. So it's just going to be A1 V1 delta T and on the right that's going to be uh, A2 V2 delta T and then if you just cancel out the delta T you get the equation of continuity. All right. uh, now you can if you multiply both sides by the mass then this equation just says the mass of fluid entering on the left is equal to the mass of fluid exiting on the right that's also uh, another form of the continuity equation okay all right uh, in general this quantity a1 multiplied by v1 is called the volume flow rate of a fluid so it tells you how much how many cubic meters of uh, of the fluid are flowing past that uh, section of the uh, pipe per second so that's the volume flow rate uh, I, I should just say a multiplied by V in general is called the volume flow rate and uh, you know that if you multiply volume by density you get mass so rho times a times V is called the mass flow rate so that just tells you how much mass or how many kilograms of fluid are flowing past that section of the pipe okay so the equation that we just derived uh, a1 a1 v1 equals a2 v2 is our first important equation the equation of continuity all right so let's uh, look at an example of applying that So suppose you have this artery which is carrying blood. Sometimes a situation like this develops. What is this? This is just black. So what's going to happen to the velocity of the blood as it's flowing through this constricted part of the artery? So let's say that the velocity here is v1 and the velocity here is v2. Where is the velocity going to be higher? Obviously the velocity will be higher, velocity v2 is going to be higher or the blood will be flowing faster through the constricted part of the artery because of the equation of continuity, right? Um, how would we measure the velocity of blood? The easiest way to, I mean one of the, I don't know if it's the easiest, uh, but one way of measuring the velocity of blood is by measuring the velocity of red blood cells. So the red blood cells are large hard objects which flow along with the blood. If you send some ultrasound waves, which are basically just sound waves, these sound waves, these ultrasound waves bounce off these red blood cells and the frequency of the reflected waves is going to be a little bit different from the frequency of the waves that you're sending in. So let's say that you're sending in ultrasound waves of 1000 Hertz. You're going to learn what Hertz is hopefully if we ever get to chapter 15. Um, uh, if you're sending so you're sending in 1000 Hertz you might find that the waves are that are bouncing off them and uh, these red blood cells and coming back are 1010 Hertz or something up I'm totally making up the numbers here so from that you can easily figure out the velocity of the red blood cells and this is something called the Doppler effect okay suppose you do the same thing over here you send in your ultrasound over here since the velocity of the red blood cells is greater you'll find that uh, instead of you're sending in a thousand Hertz over here the reflected sound has 
1020 hertz or something like that so that tells you that the red blood cells are moving much faster over here and so you can figure out that there is there must be a blockage in the artery in this section because the speed of the blood is higher so this is called sonography and it's an important medical medical tool doppler sonography okay and i have a plug and chug type of problem uh, slide 28 all right so that's the equation of continuity the next thing that we're going to talk about is bernoulli's equation notice that the equation of continuity is simply uh, a consequence of conservation of mass right? so the amount of mass entering on one side has to equal the amount of mass in exiting the other side and that is why we had the equation of continuity uh, Bernoulli's equation is simply a conservation uh, a consequence of conservation of energy so I'm not going to derive Bernoulli's equation for you just because you can easily find the derivation in any standard textbook your book also has a nice derivation um, but keep in mind that the equation that the equation that I'm going to write down does not have any new physics in it. It is just a consequence of k0 plus u0 plus w other equals k final plus u final. So if you apply it uh, with a few four or five lines of algebra, you can derive Bernoulli's equation. Okay, so what is Bernoulli's equation? Suppose you have a pipe um, like this maybe the pipe goes up like that and if its cross section changes okay consider a point over here let's call that the point a and consider another point over here let's call that the point b actually it's better if we just call them one and two let's call this our point one and our point two now relative to some completely arbitrary reference point um, let's call this to be our y equals zero we are measuring heights from here let's say that point one is at a height y1 and point two is at a height y2 okay let the pressure at point one be p1 and let the velocity and i'm just using different colors for these let the velocity be v1 right same things at point 2 we know the height of point 2 uh, let's say that the velocity of the fluid is v2 and the pressure is p2 at this point okay all right now these three quantities p pressure velocity and height uh, are connected through a certain equation and that equation is the following uh, if you at any point in the fluid if you were to calculate this quantity pressure plus half rho velocity square plus rho times g times y that will be a constant at every point in the fluid right okay and that is this equation is called Bernoulli's equation so I could evaluate the quantities uh, this particular quantity pressure plus half rho velocity square plus rho g y and if I, I no matter which point I evaluated it at point one point two or any other point in the flow I will get exactly the same numerical answer right so I can immediately connect the variables at point one with the variables at point two by simply writing this equation p1 plus half rho v1 square plus rho g y1 is equal to p2 plus half rho v2 square plus rho g y2 and this is an application of Bernoulli's equation so this equation is called Bernoulli's equation
And uh, this is how you usually apply it when you're doing problems. So you pick two points uh, and then you set up Bernoulli's equation. Sometimes you also have to set up the, uh, the equation of um, continuity, a1 v1 equals a2 v2. And then uh, you can solve for any variable that you're looking for. That's pretty much that you do all that you do when you're solving problems. Okay, let's look at some applications of Bernoulli's equation. So first, let's look at a very simple application where a fluid is at rest. So here is a container of fluid. It's at rest. Let's say that this point has pressure P1. And this point has pressure P2. And let this point be at a height Y2. And let this point be at a height Y1. So this height is Y2, this height is Y1. All right, the fluid is at rest. So the velocity is zero everywhere for every point in the fluid. Right? Okay, so we're doing the case where the fluid is at rest. So um, V1 and V2 would both be zero, right? So uh, V1 and V2 would both be zero. You can cross those out. And so what we get is P2 plus rho G Y2 is equal to P1 plus rho G Y1. I just uh, put the right hand side of the equation on the left. It doesn't make any difference. And then I can write P2 minus P1 is equal to rho G Y1 minus Y2. Does this equation look familiar? This is the same equation that we had early on in this chapter. And we had derived, this basically leads to the fact that the pressure at a certain depth is equal to rho g h. Um, we had derived this equation using in a completely different way uh, by considering equilibrium. And here we've, we've seen that you can get the same equation from Bernoulli if you start with Bernoulli's equation. Right? So that's just a simple illustration. Let's consider another situation. Suppose you have, so this is an equation that we had seen earlier. Uh, okay, now suppose you have a fluid, uh, suppose you've got a pipe whose uh, cross section um, changes. Okay, I'll make this side of the pipe a little longer. All right, so let's consider two points which are at the same elevation. Maybe a point over here and a point over here. Right? All right, let the pressure at this point be P1 and the velocity at this point be v1 and the pressure at this point let it be p2 and the velocity at this point let that be v2 right the height y is the same for both of these points okay okay Okay, now let's apply Bernoulli's equation. So we get P1 plus half rho V1 squared is equal to P2 plus half rho V2 squared. The term that involves the Y will cancel out because the Y is the same on both sides. So it's going to be plus rho GY on the left and plus rho GY on the right. So that'll just cancel out. So this tells us something very interesting. It tells us that if you consider two points which are roughly at the same elevation, then there is a sort of, uh, there is a relationship between pressure and velocity, right? And it's sort of an inverse relationship, meaning that if the pressure is higher, the velocity has to be lower. 
Why is that? The sum of this quantity and this quantity is constant, right? Because you can evaluate it at any point. Uh, it's just going to be uh, it's going to be the same everywhere. So the sum of this quantity which in the the first term which involves the pressure and the second term which involves the velocity is constant so if the pressure term is large then half rho v square has to be small because their sum is fixed so if one quantity is large the other one has to be small and so if so this lead, lead, leads you to the conclusion that if pressure is high velocity is low and the converse is also true. If pressure is low, the velocity is high. So at a place where the velocity of the fluid is large, where it's moving very fast, pressure is going to be smaller. And at a place where the fluid is moving, is moving slowly, um, the pressure is going to be high, right? So please keep this in mind. Pressure going, pressure being low means velocity is higher and pressure higher means velocity is lower. So this is just the same thing. I just wrote it uh, in easier to remember way. This has many fascinating consequences. One consequence is the following. Uh, suppose you have uh, an umbrella and let's say that it's raining and it's a very uh, windy day. Okay, you might often find that, so it's a, it's a tremendously windy day, right? You might often find that uh, if you've ever walked out with an umbrella on a very windy day, you might notice that there is, seems to be a force on the umbrella, but strangely the force is not in the direction of the wind, but it's more in the upward direction, as if the umbrella is trying to take off in the vertical direction. And in fact, if the wind is strong enough, then this is what might happen. The umbrella flips. Okay, so why is there a force in the upward direction? Let's think about that. Consider a point right above the umbrella. And consider a point right underneath the umbrella. Where is the velocity higher? Velocity of the wind. Clearly, the velocity of the wind is much higher above the umbrella because the wind can flow unrest unrestricted. Under the dome of the umbrella, uh, the wind cannot flow that fast because it's, it's kind of trapped. So the velocity is V is much higher over here. V is much lower under the dome of the umbrella, right? So if V is higher, what happens to the pressure? Pressure is lower over here. Pressure is higher over there. So there's higher pressure underneath the umbrella lower pressure above the umbrella, right? So you have a net force in the upward direction, right? And that, that is what makes you think the umbrella is being pulled upwards and, um, uh, and eventually the umbrella can, um, can uh, get completely bent in the opposite direction. Okay, a similar, a similar application, a similar example to this is Whenever there are major storms or very, very strong winds, you'll often hear about the roofs of certain buildings flying off, right? So if there's a very strong wind, the roof of a building might fly off and land somewhere else. Right? So what causes the roof of a building to fly off? Well, same exact explanation. You can probably figure it out yourself. Consider a point inside the building underneath the roof and consider a point just above the roof. Where is the velocity going to be higher? The velocity is going to be higher um, above the roof where you have very strong winds. So the velocity is going to be high. So that's me that means the pressure is going to be lower above the roof. The pressure is going to be higher just underneath the roof, right? So there is a pressure difference above and below the roof. 
So the pressure underneath the roof is just going to be atmospheric and the pressure above the roof is going to be less than atmospheric because of uh, the flowing wind. So you're gonna, it's, this is going to be just like that um, example question on the, uh, at the beginning of this PowerPoint. What is the net force going to be uh, on the roof? And the answer is the net force is going to be the area of the roof multiplied by the difference in pressure. Now, if, if this is a large building, the roof can be pretty large. So A can be a very large quantity. And if the winds are blowing really fast, then the difference in pressure can be pretty large too. So large area multiplied by large difference in pressure could give you a very large force, which might be uh, strong enough to just take the roof off. Okay. Um, another example would be um, okay, let's let's look at I have some nice examples over here in the PowerPoint. All right, so this guy is in a plane and uh, he is soon going to have a very nice idea brilliant idea he opens it and he puts oh what happened to his phone whoops okay let's watch this again the the phone just flew out all right so what's going on over here So what, what's going on is, uh, you can easily understand it from Bernoulli's principle, uh, the velocity uh, on uh, one side of the phone outside the plane is very, very high because, the, uh, uh, because it's the, the wind moving in the opposite direction. So the velocity is extremely high. The velocity on the other side of the phone uh, in, inside the cabin of the plane is uh, is much smaller and so there is a tremendous difference in pressure uh, uh, because velocity on one side is much higher velocity on the other side is lower so the, there is a pressure difference and that pressure difference is uh, enough to uh, knock the phone out of the person's hand okay we're going to talk about one more example okay uh, let, let's just consider a ball which has been thrown and let's say that the ball is moving in the forward to the right like this the center of mass velocity of the ball is to the right and uh, the ball happens to be rotating in the clockwise direction so it's kind of like that example that we did with the clock uh, in chapter 10 so the ball is rotating clockwise and uh, it's also moving to the right as a whole now in general uh, if the ball has a rough surface, it's going to carry a thin skin of air which is going to rotate along with it. So it's going to carry this thin skin of air that's going to rotate, try to rotate along with it. Okay, now remember that the ball is moving to the right. So there is a wind moving in the opposite direction. I mean, the air is flowing in the opposite direction. So the direction of the air flow on both sides of the ball is like this. Consider the velocity of a point uh, of an air molecule, which is underneath the ball. Which direction is the air molecule moving as a result of the rotation of the ball? Obviously, since the thin skin of air surrounding the ball uh, is rotating with the ball, uh, the air molecule over here would have a tangential velocity to the left, right? And so, um, and, and what about uh, an air molecule which is uh, right above the ball? So that would have a tangential velocity to the right 
because it's moving uh, it, because it's because of the rotation of the ball all right so consider the net velocity of the air molecule above and below the ball so below the ball the air molecule is moving to the left the air flow is also to the left so the resulting velocity of the air molecule is high above the ball the air molecule has one velocity which is pointed to the right as a result of the rotation uh, with the ball but then the air flow is in the opposite direction so it's difficult for the air molecule uh, to move forward because the air flow is in the opposite direction so the velocity above the ball is low now we can apply Bernoulli's equation we know that when the velocity is high the pressure is going to be low so v high means p is low and v low means p is high so you have high pressure above the ball and low pressure below the ball and as a result of that the ball uh, will feel a downward force and it will start uh, so there will be a net downward force on the ball. Clearly, if the ball were spinning in the opposite direction, uh, there would be a net upward flow uh, force on the ball. And you can easily uh, apply the reasoning and make sure that you that's what you get. If the ball were spinning in the counterclockwise direction, the net force would be in the upward direction. Okay. So this uh, principle is, of, is used in various sports, though I know very little about sports, so this is all stuff that I've uh, read or heard from other people. So in tennis, apparently, um, this particular situation is called uh, topspin, and this makes the tennis ball deflect in the downward direction, right? So you can make the tennis ball deflect in the downward direction if you... Uh, using your racket if you give it a spin like this uh, the opposite of this I think is called bottom spin I don't know um, yeah there might be a different term for it I don't know but that would make the ball deflect in the upward direction when it's initially traveling horizontally um, I, I believe that it's also this is also used in uh, in uh, football uh, you where you have a ball that looks like this and uh, you give the ball a spin and that makes the ball turn as it's moving uh, through the air um, so so this has many applications I'll show you one rather striking application which is this video so you should watch this video on your own computer so that you hear the sound so what he's going to do is he's going to drop the ball from a very high bridge. Okay, so the ball deflects a little bit. All right, but now he's going to give the ball a spin and we'll see what happens and look at that so the ball deflects quite a bit uh, in exactly the way that we analyzed it would uh, given the spin that he gave it and the fact that it's going downwards if you apply the same analysis that we just did uh, you you would be able to predict the fact that the ball will uh, move in the direction that it actually did okay all right one last example that we could uh, briefly discuss before we move on is um, lift of airplanes keep in mind that this is a very very simplistic explanation so uh, 
Aeroplane flight is a complicated subject, but I'm going to try to explain it. I'll, sh I'll show you that Bernoulli's principle has some relevance over there. So basically the idea is that this, let's say that this is the cross section of a wing uh, of a plane, right? Um, the upper part is curved and the lower part is flat. Now the plane, let's say, is moving to the right, okay? All right. Now, if the plane is moving to the right, there will be air flowing above the plane and underneath the plane, right? Now, for reasons which are quite complicated and uh, uh, we don't have time to get into them, but it's very fascinating nevertheless, um, the velocity of the air over the curved surface will be higher. And the velocity uh, under the wing where the surface is flat will be lower. Why is the velocity higher? Uh, the, as I said, the reason is rather complicated and um, it's not something that can be easily explained here uh, but uh, I mean it would take me a while to go over that and that would be another half an hour video <laughs> but uh, that would add to the length of the video by another half an hour uh, if you really wanted the correct explanation. Um, one incorrect explanation that you often see is the following and, and I'm just going to tell you the incorrect explanation just so you know that it's not correct. Uh, that kind of goes like this you had two air molecules which were just minding their own business over here and then this wing of the airplane came and separated them right but before these air molecules separated they made a pact that they would see each other again once the wing had passed now the air molecule at the top now has to cover a much longer distance to get back uh, to the other end of the wing whereas the air molecule at the bottom has to cover a shorter distance and so the air molecule at the, uh, at the top has to move at a higher speed to get back to the same position after uh, the wing has passed by, right? However, this explanation is completely wrong. Uh, that is because there is no law of nature which says that two air molecules which were side by side at a certain time have to be side by side at a later time again. Um, so there is, there is no such law of nature. So that explanation is wrong. Um, the real explanation is, is complicated, so I'm not talking about that at all. But the point is that the velocity of the air uh, above the wing will be higher and the velocity will be lower underneath the wing. So you, you can do the rest yourself. The pressure over here will be lower and the pressure over here will be higher. And so that tells you that there will be a net force in the upward direction and this net force is called the force of lift and that is what keeps a plane uh, in the air. Okay, so that's one more application of Bernoulli's equation. All right, so let's just do one example of a problem involving Bernoulli's equation. Uh, this is a very standard problem and it's fully worked out on the slide but I think uh, it's a good idea to look at this problem together. So, um, so what is this problem saying? It's saying that uh, you have a cylindrical uh, water tank uh, that has a small hole uh, in its side below water level. Uh, you are given the y, the height of the hole and you're given the height of the water, I mean the, the depth of the water, that's y2. Okay, and you have to find out the velocity of the water as it's flowing out of the hole. Okay, so how do you do this? Well, when you apply Bernoulli's equation, the strategy is always to choose two convenient points and use the fact that p plus half rho v square plus rho g y would be the same when it's evaluated at those two points. That's, that's always the strategy. Now you can choose any two points you want, but it's convenient to choose points for which we know something. So one fact that we've often mentioned throughout this chapter is that 
if a certain point is in contact with the atmosphere, what is its pressure? It's going to be atmospheric pressure, right? So it's convenient to choose one point over here and another point right here. So our point one, let's say, our point two is on the surface of the liquid and our point one is somewhere uh, at this hole where the liquid is gushing out, right? So both of these points are in contact with the atmosphere. So we know what their pressures are. They're just atmospheric pressure, right? Let's apply Bernoulli's equation to both these points. So P1 plus half rho V1 square, and that V1 is what we're looking for, plus rho G Y1 is equal to P2 plus half rho V2 square plus rho G Y2. Okay. So the P's are P1 and P2 are both equal to P, P atmospheric, I mean. So I can just cancel these two out. And so I'm left with this simple equation, 1 half rho V1 square plus rho G Y1 is equal to 1 half rho V2 square plus rho G Y2. Now I would be able to solve for V from this equation, but there is one problem, I don't know what V2 is, right? Um, I do know what y1 and y2 are, so I'm almost there. I just need to figure out what v2 is. So I told you that in Bernoulli's equation problems, sometimes you also have to use the equation of continuity. So what does the equation of continuity give us? Let's say that this area let's say that this area is a2 and this area here is a1. The equation of continuity gives us a1 v1 is equal to a2 v2 and v2 is the velocity with which the a particle of fluid is moving uh, on the surface uh, obviously that's going to be in the downward direction because uh, the, the f level of water is gradually going down but it's at, at a very slow slow pace. So you can see that V2 is going to be much smaller than V1 just from the equation of continuity that we just wrote down. You can see that V2 is going to be A2 divided by A1 sorry A1 divided by A2 P1. So that implies that V2 since A1 the problem tells us that A1, the area of the hole, is much smaller than A2. You can see that V2 is much, much smaller than V1. So that means you can just ignore V2. In this problem, it's okay to just ignore V2 in comparison to V1. So you could just ignore this term. It's approximately zero. So from there, you can solve for V1. So um, v1 square is equal to, if you just rearrange things a little bit, uh, 2g y2 minus y1. And so if you take a square root, you get v is equal to, v1 is equal to 2g y2 minus y1. And that is the answer. Okay, so that's pretty much how you do Bernoulli's equation problems. And uh, that's all there is to this chapter. So I'll just end the video here.